So thank you again for the opportunity to speak today, and good evening to everybody. I know it's a tough time in the world, and uh, it's also a good time to catch up on some education. Uh, so thank Corin for putting this together. Let me talk about how this all got started for me. This is my first patient uh, that I ever thought about these kind of concepts in. Um, I had always heard about the hip spine relationship and somehow how pelvic tilt could affect cup position, um, but nobody could ever figure out what I needed to do about it or how I even could work it up. Um, so luckily, the first couple weeks in practice, I saw a patient like this, and she had these scoliosis x-rays. Um, yeah, I looked at it, and all I knew was that it was a crooked spine, and I didn't really know what to do with it for a hip replacement, and I was nervous. You know, I was a couple months into practice. Um, so I did what I think any of us should do is present it at a multi-specialty conference. I presented it at the hip replacement and spine grand round. Um, basically 25 hip surgeons, 25 spine surgeons in the room. I presented this case. Now the spine fellows got up there. They started uh, measuring a bunch of different things on the x-rays. And this is what they came up with. They measured some a bunch of three-letter words that I don't even know what they are, and um, then said, go ahead and do your hip replacement as normal, and um, that's what we've always been taught. So out of those 50 people, only one on, only one person in that entire room uh, knew what I was talking about, that the position of the pelvis could actually change the position of my hip replacement, um, and that was a surgeon whose name is Aaron Buckland, and, and the rest has been history. We've been writing uh, papers about this and trying to simplify this ever since. Um, and really trying to figure it out uh, for ourselves. So this is the end result there. I used a dual mobility device, which is what I do when I get nervous about stability uh, in hip replacement. Um, and luckily, she's had a great uh, result since that time in 2012. So that really got us thinking about all these concepts. What we're teaching here is really nothing to do with only the cup position, right? We really want to know how to do a good hip replacement. And that has to do with a lot of different things. And if you think back to how you learned how to template a hip replacement, it all has to do with the position of the cup and the stem, the orientation of the cup and the stem, which are two different things, then the leg length and offset, kind of balancing that hip and those soft tissues. That's all we're doing when we're talking about this. And the hip spine relationship is important to the cup position here. The femoral position also very important. And then the leg length and offset helps us really balance those tissues, get that trochanter away from the pelvis, and optimize the impingement. Now, in 2020, we do have technology that exists today that tells you exactly where you need to put your cup, uh, to the best of our knowledge, I think. Um, but you do have to order x-rays. You have to order the spine x-rays in order to make that possible. Uh, for some people, that may not be feasible in their workflow, or they think it may not be feasible in their workflow. Uh, but we've written several papers about the cost effectiveness, cost effectiveness of this workup. Um, so I think it's safe to say that you can go ahead and do this. And then next step is, once I give you a prescription of a target, like 43 degrees of inclination, 26 degrees of aniversion, you actually have to go hit that target. Um, and not many people use technology today in, in the United States. It's about 10%. And we're certainly learning from our Australian colleagues and in the Australian National Joint Replacement Registry, uh, navigation seems to have better outcomes. So hopefully people in my country in the U.S. will start picking up on this and, and when our adoption will increase. Because we know that we're really not that good at hitting targets. Only about 60% in this paper from back in 2011. Why is this stuff important? Hip instability continues to be the number one cause of revision total hip replacement and also the number one cause of re-revision total hip replacement. This is the latest data from the 2019 American Joint Replacement Register report. Uh, it's still more than infection. You know, infection gets a lot of uh, publicity, let's say, I think, because it's harder to treat. Uh, but hip instability is the number one cause of revision total hips. So clearly a very important need. Why make a change? This may be not so important in Australia, but certainly in the United States. Our, our government pays us a bundle payment for each hip replacement that we do in the Medicare population, which is the majority of these. Anything we do that can decrease the cost, the savings for the hospital, and ultimately in the surgeon's pocket. Uh, anything we do that makes more cost is uh, takes away from that. So 
The hospitals are very keen on reducing our readmissions. And certainly a revision or a revision for dislocation or a readmission for dislocation can be costly. Same thing with malpractice. Uh, I live in New York, one of the highest litigious places in the country. So 5% of the claims are due to hip dislocation. The physician actually loses one every five of those with an average settlement of $450,000. So very important to surgeons, I think, and you should really be cognizant of the revisions you do for dislocation in your own practice. And this will also give you techniques for managing those tips that you see from an outside surgeon that are dislocating. So why do total hips dislocate? The Rush Group came up with these six criteria, whether it's the acetabular side, the femoral side, maybe it's a soft tissue dysfunction, impingement, late poly wear, or unclear ideologies. Today we're going to focus on really the acetabular side, the impingement part of this. This unclear ideology is most likely the hip spine relationship. And then with some of the templating software, we'll get into the femoral component position, although it's a little less understood. What we're really trying to do is identify who is high risk. We looked at 2,900 hip replacements here and found that if you had a one or two level fusion, your dislocation rate was almost double that of a control group. If you had three or more levels fused, you almost had a 5% dislocation rate, almost five times higher. So clearly, there's a group of patients who are at risk for instability. Now you might say, okay, I'll just look for all the patients that have screws in their back. Well, we looked at this and we actually found that out of 6,000 patients in this particular study, only 6% of them had a stiff spine. Only 19% of those actually had an instrumental infusion. So the majority of patients who have stiff spines actually did not have pedicle screws in their back, nor were they prior or after previous spine surgery. These patients all had degenerative spines that led them to be functionally fused. Out of all these instrumented fusions, only 32 of those had stiff spines. This is a patient here you can clearly see as they go from a standing to a sitting position, the pelvis is actually moving and the spine is relaxing. So this patient, even though they have a spine fusion, does not have a stiff spine. So clearly there's some link here between a stiff spine and instability. Secondarily, we looked at another group of patients, the spine deformity patients, and 139 of those, and found that they have an 8% dislocation rate versus 1.5, which is the control group. So clearly a very high-risk cohort of patients. Uh, there are some literature studies out there that actually have a 15 and 19% dislocation rate in the spinal deformity population. So a very, very risky group of patients. Now, you may think that these patients don't pop up very frequently in your office. So we looked at that, and we looked at 1,000 patients and found that 16% of them had a spine deformity by the way that the spine surgeons measure spine deformity, which is pelvic incidence minus lumbar lordosis. 4% of those actually had a severe spine deformity, so PILL greater than 20 degrees. We completed that study. We actually went up to almost 10,000 patients and 13% of those patients had adverse spinal pelvic mobility, which is risky for dislocation. And again, 18% of those had a spine deformity. So clearly, almost one in five patients you see in the office are going to have some sort of spine deformity, which could potentially put them at risk, almost up to 8%, maybe 10, 15% risk of having a dislocation. So those are the patients we want to identify and those are the patients we want to do something differently during our hip replacement in order to keep them from having a significant dislocation event. So there's two separate issues here. One is the spinal stiffness, and this is where you need to compensate your surgery for the lack of spine or pelvis mobility. And the second issue is the spine deformity, where based on the anatomy, you actually need to put your cup in a different position. Now, they're very subtly different, these two concepts, but both the cup actually needs to be different than what you think is the classical window of 40 and 20. If you look at all the literature, and there's probably about 15, 16 papers comparing all these different factors, uh, the number one risk factor is stiff spine. Whether you get a, uh, depending on what kind of sitting x-ray you get, whether it's a flex seated x-ray or a relaxed seated x-ray, which I'll show you in a little bit, uh, that's a risk factor. A standing pelvic tilt more than 10 degrees with a posterior pelvic tilt, that's a really big risk factor. 
And then if you have a spine deformity with a PILL mismatch greater than 20 degrees, that again is another significant risk factor. Now, our original workup consisted of two x-rays, a standing lateral x-ray and a sitting lateral x-ray. This is in addition to what you normally would get for your AP pelvis, uh, your AP and frog of the hip uh, for templating purposes. And then we almost only measured two lines, the anterior pelvic plane and a line on top of the sacrum. And you'd see how that line moved from one position to the next. Now in 2020, we've evolved our workup. We can still measure those two lines, or we can measure a lot of other things, which I'll show you. But now we're going to get a standing lateral x-ray. And instead of that relaxed sitting x-ray, we're going to get an x-ray where you're bending all the way forward. I want to see what that body is doing when this person is going to get up from sitting. The majority of your posterior dislocations happen when somebody is sitting or in a, in a low chair, and then they lean forward and they get up from sitting. So I want to know what the body is doing in that particular position. So step number one, we're going to get that standing lateral. We're going to look at the anterior pelvic plane. That's the ASIS to the pubic synthesis that you see here on the x-ray, this green line straight up and down. And then you can measure some other things in the spine, which we'll get to. And then I'm going to get a flex seated x-ray, which is leaning all the way forward, just about to get up from that sitting position. So I can see how far the pelvis is moving forward and then I can plan my hip replacement accordingly. So we used to get this relaxed seated view. Now we're starting to get this flex seated view because it's giving us more information about who's at risk. Here this is schematically. Normally in a relaxed seated position, the pelvis is going to roll back. That acetabular component is going to open up and it's going to give you space so you don't have impingement between the acetabulum and the femur. In a flex seated position, I actually want to see how much that cup is going to close down. I want to see how much that pelvis is moving forward in order to position the cup, position the femur all appropriately to keep this from having an impingement event, which is going to lead to dislocation. So the two reasons really for that flex seated x-ray is that the hip is in deeper flexion. It's going to be more representative of the posterior dislocation position. And I can really evaluate the true flexibility of the lumbar spine. When you're doing that flex seated position, it's the analogous of the spine and scoliosis surgeons doing lateral bending films. They want to see what's the excursion of the spine, how flexible is it, and how much do they need to correct during surgery. We're doing the exact same thing except in the opposite plane. We're doing a bending film except it's a bending forward film. All this leads us to really figuring out how do we position the cup. And Willinick 1978 came up with his safe zone. I think everyone's familiar with this article, but basically 40 and 15 and, and plus or minus 10 degrees. Now we know that three of his dislocations actually happened from within that safe zone. So clearly that safe zone was not safe for these particular patients. Mayo Clinic showed us the same thing. 10,000 total hip replacements, 2% dislocation rates. Half of their dislocations were actually inside the Lewinick safe zone. Why is that? Because the pelvis actually moves. Lewinick plotted these static dots, but as the person is sitting, as they're standing, as they're walking, as they're tying their shoes, bending over, anything they're doing to try to screw up your perfectly good hip replacement, their pelvis is moving and the cup is moving. So maybe we need to start thinking about instead of a safe zone, but a safe range for each particular patient more patient-specific customized surgery. Once we give you a target, then you actually have to go execute the plan. Intraoperative execution, for the most part, I think, with conventional instrumentation, uh, is the transverse acetabular ligament. This was a very elegant study here. They matched all these cups to the TAL and compared it to the anterior pelvic plane. And basically, if you match up your cup to the transverse acetabular ligament, your cup is going to be at 20 degrees of anaversion plus or minus seven degrees. So if you think of two standard deviations above that, uh, you're gonna be, at, it's quite a big range there. But in general, on average, 20 degrees of antiversion. However, this doesn't play into the whole spinal deformity part. Not everybody's pelvis is straight up and down. When you get that standing lateral x-ray, you can see a pelvis leaning forward. You can see one leaning back slightly. And you can see one leaning back quite a bit. If you see that picture on the far right, and even the picture in the middle, those are cases you're going to be worried about. 
These patients are potentially very high risk for instability after a hip replacement, in my opinion, the highest risk. Because if you match them to the transverse acetabular ligaments, the body's actually going to add a lot of antiversion for you. That's due to the spinal deformity. Well, in these cases, you actually have to put a little bit less antiversion. So it may actually look funny to you, uh, but that's what you need to do based on the impingement modeling that I'm going to show you. Just to highlight this concept a little further, let's start on the right side of the screen. You've got that standing lateral view. You can see the patient has a very flat back. There's no curvature in that lumbar spine at all. His pelvis is tilted posteriorly quite a bit. So if you got an AP pelvis x-ray, you're going to be looking at this outlet view here. And what that's going to do, if you put your cup into the transverse acetabular ligament to the native anatomy, this patient actually lives like this here. They live with their pelvis posteriorly tilted and that cup way open staring you at the in your face. So this is a patient where you have to dial down your antiversion depending on how much pelvic tilt that they have. Going to give you a little bit of a refresher about the spinal pelvic parameters. Pelvic tilt is the anterior pelvic plane that I was measuring in the previous slide. Basically, the ASIS down to the pubic symphysis. This one is the normal, basically straight up and down. Lumbar lordosis is what we learned from our pediatric rotations. Cobb angle between S1, the top of S1 there, and the top of L1. And then the pelvic incidence is a morphological parameter that stays constant for the most part with age. So this is something that's different for every patient, but it stays constant for their entire life, and it gives us an idea of the width of the pelvis. A little bit of advanced concepts here. Pelvic incidence minus lumbar lordosis is the way spine surgeons measure spinal deformity, and it gives you an idea of the balance of the spine. Anything greater than 10 degrees is a spine deformity by their definitions, um, and anything greater than about 15 or 20 degrees is where things get very risky in terms of your hip replacement and the spinal pelvic mobility. So I know I've been through a lot of measurements here and a lot of different concepts, but sometimes it may be easier to let somebody else measure. So if you get these three x-rays, you send the images to the company and they're going to measure for you. In this particular patient, you can see the pelvis is not very interesting. It just stays in the same position regardless of what the patient does. They lean forward, their spine changes, uh, the pelvis actually doesn't move. This particular patient here, you can see in that middle x-ray, that when they lean forward, that cup is almost completely horizontal because the pelvis moves so far forward. You can imagine if this patient leans any more forward, tries to get up out of the chair, they're going to impinge that hip replacement and try to dislocate out the back. So these are two different patients with two completely different movement profiles and actually very similar spinal pelvic measurements. So you have you would have missed this whole thing completely had you just gotten a standing x-ray, and you would have missed it completely had you just gotten a relaxed seated x-ray. So very important to get that flexed seated x-ray. Here's one case of ours. I'm going to show you some of the software that we go, we're going to go through today. Um, but basically, you can see some case information at the top. In this little box here at the top left, you have some alerts and comments. This is a nice discussion box with the engineers who are planning the software for you. You have some measurements at the top, which are important, and those leg length and offset, and also femoral version. In the top middle there, you've got your, your position of your acetabular components. And then you've got this advanced section where you can get much further into depth of what they're going to have. And I'll show you what that looks like uh, in a minute. We've got three tabs here, a dynamic tab, a cup tab, lab, and a, and a stem tab. And then we're going to get to what each of those do. So on the cup tab, you can plan your cup in three dimensions on the coronal, sagittal, and axial planes. You also have a 3D picture of the cup, which I'll show you. And then it really allows you to manipulate everything and plan it just perfectly. On the stem tab, you can do the same thing, CT-based templating of the stem in all different planes. It allows you to see if you're going to match the antiversion of that femur or if you may have to change it a little bit. Um, we, I don't even tell you if you're able to change it or not. You can see on the far right, you've got this little, uh, basically this different diagram of the, the heat map there. And it tells you how your bone equality is. This may be a patient you want to think about cementing, given the fact that the bone quality is pretty poor in this case. 
so you can manipulate all of your orientations via, via your osteotomy planes. And I'll, I'm going to take you through a live demo here in a second. This is just a quick contingent model. After all, you, after all positioning of the components, you can actually run a live impingent model of what that hip is going to look like. You can see that the pelvis is moving here, and the pelvis is moving exactly as this patient moves based on the flex seated x-ray that you got. In this particular case, you can see as that pelvis goes into flexion and that femur goes into flexion, you've got impingement as a prosthesis. I'm not so sure that we should have any prosthetic impingement these days because we can model these things in advance, we can predict that it's going to happen, and then we can make adjustments to keep this from happening. We change the cut position here in that case, and that's going to keep it from dislocating. So I think in conclusion, really, historic target parameters are really different than our target values we're using uh, with the functional imaging. Um, we really want to reduce the risk of dislocation by identifying the patients who are high risk and then doing something differently. And I'm going to show you some cool software that's going to allow you to make some of those decisions and then help you execute your interoperative plan. Thanks a lot for your attention and uh, hope looking forward to the question and answer session. Oh, great talk, John. Um, questions have come through here. I'm going to try and group these into themes. Uh, I won't have time to get to all of these, but um, Actually, some similar themes here to the talk we gave earlier today. Um, you talk about your evolution moving from a relaxed seated view to a flex seated view. Um, it looks like we've got some people here who are starting their journey here and have started to use that relaxed seated view. Question, I guess, is John, if, if you're not doing the flex seated view, is there a risk that you're missing some patients that would fall into that at risk profile? So, I think that. We, we did a paper, we looked at 50 patients where we got both the relaxed seated view and the flex seated views on. And we, the majority of the time, almost half of those patients, when you did the flex seated view, you picked up something that was at risk or that you might have missed on the relaxed sitting view. So it does give you a little bit more information. Um, I've certainly been teaching for the last few years on how to just do a relaxed seated view. Um, and that may be kind of overcalling the risk. You may get some flex seated x-rays and say, wow, that patient is completely safe uh, when the relaxed seated uh, view told you they were risky. So I think it's helpful in both ways, both telling you somebody's safe when in fact you thought they were risky on the relaxed seated view. And then the second one is picking up additional risk because somebody you may think is okay is, is completely leaning forward with their entire pelvis when they're on that flex seated view. So you are about half the time getting more information and out of those 50 patients. So pretty small sample size though. Okay. And again, some questions here around alternatives, John. So um, question here suggesting that maybe you can uh, understand the position of the pelvis in space uh, from the AP radiology, looking at the shape of the obturators and, and your inlet outlet views. Can you comment on maybe the accuracy of doing that versus the sagittal imaging? Sure. So every time you take an AP pelvis, uh, it's very sensitive to the position of how the tech took it. If they took the x-ray that's too low, it's, they're, all the pelvises are going to look like outlet views. If you take it too high, they're all going to look like inlet views. Um, we did a survey of 150 orthopedic surgeons looking at 100 AP pelvis x-rays, and all we asked them to do was to classify whether it's an anterior tilt, posterior tilt, or neutral. Um, and I personally got a 54%. Um, so I wasn't very good at it. And you may think that I, that I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, so then we went to Jim Pierpont, who basically designed uh, most of this OPS software, and he basically, he got one question better than I did. So he wasn't very good either. I mean, he's the guy who had the answer key. So unless you have an EOS, uh, which is almost like a perfect CT scranogram at, ex at every level of the pelvis, uh, just an AP pelvis from the radiology is not accurate enough. Thanks, John. Um, and one question here, I guess, directed at your uh, practice specifically. Do you get this routine hip spine workup on all comers, John, or, or are there some patients you will um, avoid this additional workup on? So personally, it's, it's just built into our workflow. Our, my office knows that every patient that we're signing up for surgery is going to get these standing and sitting x-rays. Uh, so it's all part of the routine. 
that, that way it helps me do research and collect data. Uh, we did look at the cost effectiveness of this, and we're going to publish this soon. Um, but just getting two x-rays is not costly compared to the number needed to treat to prevent the dislocation. So bringing the dislocation rate down from you know 5% down to 1% or 8% down to 1%, you have a little bit of money to play with uh, in terms of the full cost of the healthcare system. So you can pay for a dual mobility if it's reasonably priced, and you can also pay for getting these x-rays if you bring down the dislocation rates. Exactly, spending the money where it needs to be spent. Um, yep. I guess along those lines, John, uh, what have you found to be the learning curve or the process for the uh, imaging staff that are taking these views? Is this a is this a difficult concept for them to grasp? Is it is it simple? Have you had many issues uh, with your imaging in these particular poses, or has that not been a problem? No, it's actually been pretty simple. Uh, I've done this across two different hospitals and also across a couple private practice imaging centers. I think probably close to six or seven total imaging centers that are set up for this. Um, I personally had nothing to do with any of it. The rep came, he went to those imaging centers, he set them up, he showed them the protocol. Uh, I think he validates the protocol and sends the images back to Australia where they confirm that that's what they want. Um, then it's done. Um, so I can't even remember a time when we had to redo images or had subpar images. So it's a very smooth process. Okay, well, simple is good. John, I think um, given time, I think we're on time here, so I think we can skip straight to perhaps the first case demonstration. Perfect. So this is a case here, just a randomly selective uh, case. This is not a real patient. Um, this is the platform. I can show you this here. This is what your dashboard is going to look like, and then you'll click on one of the patients, um, and, and they're going to load up like this. So a little bit more information than your standard digital and acetate templating. I like to start always with the pre-op x-ray because it gives me an idea of what I'm looking at. Um, this guy has a little bit of leg length discrepancy, just some, some mild wear, and that's a pretty moderate to severe arthritis, but only minimal leg length discrepancy. Next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to look at my post-op x-ray or my predicted post-op x-ray to see what the engineers did. I mean, actually, they're pretty good at this. They're, they're not that many changes that you have to make here, um, especially because it's usually the same couple engineers that are doing your particular cases. So once they know your preferences, um, it's all built into the system. So once I know here, I think maybe my cup needs to come out a little laterally. Uh, maybe I could go a little more superior with my cup, but overall, um, it's already set up for me. My next stop is going to be the big red box here at the top. I'm telling me that my imaging is more than six months old. Um, and, you know, in a case like this with minimal wear, that's probably not that important, uh, as opposed to there being a big change from in that six-month period. It's also telling me my templating may be affected by things not captured in the CT scanner. And the femurs are cut off here because the, the CT didn't go well enough for this particular stem. So that's where the useful information is going to be. That's where it's going to tell you that you have impingement. It's going to tell you where you have any type of weird spinal pelvic parameters. All those measurements are going to be done for you. Next stop for me is going to be my spine imaging. This particular guy you see here at the top right, standing pelvic tilt of minus 11. Um, and I told you minus 10 is a risk factor, so he's getting close to being a risk factor here. Um, not really much else, though, in terms of the spine imaging is risky. Here he's leaning forward. You can see that the spine actually moves, but his pelvis stays straight up and down. So if I just toggle back from the standing x-ray to the sitting x-ray, the spine is moving very well, but the pelvis isn't moving, which is good. I don't want that pelvis to roll forward too much because that's when I'm going to get impingement. So if I want to know how much that moves, that thing, that's called lumbar flexion, how much the, the lumbar wordosis changes. Anything less than 20 degrees is risky. This guy is a 46 degrees, so it, it did not light up in red. But if this was abnormal, it would light up in red, alerting you right away that you have to do something differently. Now I've got a decent idea of what I need to do for this particular case. I'm going to go over to plan my cup. This is a demo environment, so it takes a minute there. But, you know, I wanted to kick out my cup a little bit laterally, so I could probably do a a quicker view this way. 
immediately I'm going to register that my offset increase by the same amount that I lateralized my cup. Overall, in this coronal view, it looks pretty good, actually. Nice into the bone there. There's a little bit of that acetabular cyst I'm going to try to stay out of, so I like my position, my superior position of that cup. Cup size-wise, this looks pretty good at the 60 millimeter cup. Uh, for those of you that like to measure the femoral head, if you go into the advanced tab here, it tells you your pre-diseased femoral head diameter is actually 51. So 51, and then the rule of thumb is about four millimeters difference between the pre-diseased femoral head uh, to the cup size. So that's a 55, 56. That may be a little bit oversized here. And that's where this axial view is very helpful. See what happens if I go down to a 56 millimeter cup. I do that, you can see I'm not really touching here anteriorly. Um, so I may want to click that back up to 58 millimeters. Now I've got some decent contact there. Once I put the cup where I think it wants to go, I get this nice 3D model. I can rotate it around. I can make sure I'm tucked in front of the anterior wall here, which we are. I'm just going to zoom in slightly. We're tucked in there in the anterior wall. Maybe a little bit less than I want to be tucked in. You can see here it's actually flush. It tells you how much your anterior cup coverage is. So to fix that, I can give this cup a little bit more anaversion. Um, you got to remember that I did lateralize it a touch, and that's just for the offset there. I don't like to decrease you know, the native offset. I would like to increase by a millimeter or two uh, if possible. So touch up on the cup version is going to put me in a nice position there. Um, if I line it up with my TAL, you can see it's pretty close to the TAL there, which is probably right around here. So pretty much matching his native anatomy. Once I do the cup, I'm going to go over to my stem. I can play a little bit more with my offset and leg length when I'm playing with my stem. You can see here immediately that the stem is a little bit small. So I'm going to go up on one size on that stem there. That's size 11. As soon as I did that, you can see this red box here. That's the largest size stem that they have. Um, so this particular stem design may not actually work for me. Check the x-ray. This is a nice view because this is what we're used to looking at there. And then there's also this little heat map. This is telling you contact with the bone. So even though my stem is small uh, up here approximately in the metaphyseal area, it's getting pretty close to the bone distally in here. So I've got a nice proximal to distal mismatch in the stem. Um, so this is someone I might want to go to... Uh, Maybe a metafix, which is tapered more distally. So it's giving me a lot of useful information. This is clearly oversized. You can see we're going to pop this thing. Um, so I'm going to go down a couple sizes. Especially with a nice young male, I'm going to have some thick metaphyseal bone. Just fine tune that stem geometry, and then I'm pretty happy with this. Um, nice contact everywhere around good green bone quality, so that means I'm going to impact that metaphyseal stuff. But now you can see I've changed my offset a little bit and changed my leg length. So I'll maybe try to broach that stem down a millimeter. I'm pretty good. And I'm okay with increasing the offset by four millimeters or so. Uh, depending on my soft tissue tension, I can always go down to this minus four head. So that's pretty reasonable there. I think my hip is almost in the same position. Um, in terms of the length, I don't have much room to work with. I'm happy with that. Once I do that, we're going to come over to the dynamic tab. We're going to go through the impingement. So based on how this person's pelvis moves, you guys remember that the standing lateral, the pelvis is here, 11 degrees back. Flex seated, it's only about 5 degrees back. So it moves 5 degrees forward. I'm going to mimic that exact pelvic movement when I do that. You can see the pelvis moving slightly and we're not getting any impingement. So I know I'm outside of that 40-20 window. I've got no impingement here. For those of you not in the United States, you've got approved a bony impingement. And you can see here, if I decrease my offset anymore, I'm going to be pretty close to impinging there. So this is somebody I may go back to a zero head. You can see pushes the trochanter away really nicely, um, even though I'm increasing my offset by a touch. So. Somebody may want to broach your stem down a couple more mils. 
in order to improve that impingement. A really nice tool there. You can see live what you're going to expect during surgery. And then you're going to match it up with your intraoperative exam. I have found that going into the surgery with a plan, I know it's going to be a 58 or 60 millimeter cup. I know it's going to be a size 8 metafix. Um, I, I think I have a lot lower periprosthetic fracture rate than we're starting to look at that number now. Um, CT-based planning versus previously planning with digital x-rays. Um, and it's just the more comfortable situation for me going into surgery. I broke up to my size, I put it in, put in the cup, trial, make sure everything matches and go from there. John, I know you you're think, uh, working on some literature at the moment on uh, increasing offset to avoid prosthetic and bony impingement. Um, that was a quite a good example there. You've shown an offset change of four millimeters um, to avoid that scenario. Just wondering, John, do you have a do you have a limit? Do you have a limit on how far you'd, you'd push offset to avoid that impingement before you took a, an alternative course of action? Is there a limit somewhere? So the limit, I think, is guided by what the soft tissues are going to need. So this bit, take, I'm going to bring this cut back down to the medial down to the teardrop where most people, I think, would put them. Maybe they leave a little minute off. And you really want to optimize your impingement here. So this guy's still not getting close, even decreasing his offset. He's fine. Um, but if you increase it too much in a female, uh, they get trochanteric pain. They may, they may complain. If you can increase it so much where the IT band is tight, the entire pelvis is going to shift down on that side, making them feel like they have a long leg. So um, in general, in my experience, you can go up to four or five millimeters of offset before the tissues get too tight, but it's very variable, uh, but depending on what case you're doing. Another good check is trying, if you're a posterior pro surgeon, trying to repair that posterior capsule, making sure you can repair the posterior capsule back to where you started, because that's probably a very important part of the surgery is having a nice posterior capsule repair. So I think really depends on the patient, but four to five millimeters is usually perfectly fine. Okay. Well, there's just a couple of specific questions here, John, before we move on to the next case. But um, there's just a question about that warning in the red box that says templating may be affected by anatomy not captured in the CT. Um, some question as to exactly what that refer that's referring to. Can you just maybe highlight that? That's basically showing the stem is going extending past the CT scan here. So if you have any wacky deformity or hardware down here, you're not picking it up. So that's just a just to highlight the fact that they're missing the distal part of the, the femoral cut in this particular case. You know, okay. you may see that from time to time. Some imaging center uh, cuts off the bottom part of the slices, but for the most part, the CT protocol is set in stone and you don't have that issue. I don't even think I've ever seen that issue before. Okay, and one final question here just alludes to the delivery system. Um, this is this is probably more targeted at the planning side here, John, but it might be worth just alluding to some of those 3D renderings that you briefly touched on. Um, and can you give us a flavour of whether you use those in the operating room and if they provide any uh, clinical value uh, intraoperatively? So it really depends on how you're delivering the case. If you're using a navigation system, um, you're going to rely on the navigation system, but they all have uh, their deficiencies. So you need to it's nice to have a 3D model showing you exactly what this cup, this pelvis is going to look like. So for those of you who don't navigate, having a 3D model, you can go in there and you can see what the anterior bone is going to look like. You can measure this amount of bone. How much of that is osteophyte? How much can you remove? Uh, I usually i will put the cup kind of down like this so I can see how much I need to remove in terms of the osteophyte before I'm getting into the pubis. You can see here you're kind of getting into the pubis if you take out a lot of that, but you could probably remove almost all that osteophyte. So I find this incredibly helpful to double check my navigation system. Um, and then especially if I don't have a navigation system, then I'm, I feel like I'm naked in the operating room. Um, so this really helps with that too. Try to load up this next case for us. Still there, TJ? Yep. Perfect. 
So this case had a little bit more going on. We'll see if it loads. If not, I've got a backup uh, video. John, just while we give that a minute, can you uh, mm -hmm. can you comment on the maybe the amount of time you spend on the planning page? Given that first case was fairly straightforward, fairly simple, a couple of interesting tidbits, but otherwise fairly straightforward. Can you give the the guys on the line an idea for how long you'd you'd spend planning a case like that? Are we, is it 20 minutes? Is it one minute? What do you what would you normally do? So, yeah, it breaks down exactly like my prevalence study. If you look, you know, 85% of the cases are going to be perfectly straightforward. Um, you're going to spend two or three minutes on it at the most, usually two minutes. Uh, we're, we've timed me doing all of these and average is about two minutes, 15 seconds. So we're going to spend two minutes there. You're just going to tweak the components. Uh, just like the last case you saw, not much to do. You may play around with the stem, but two minutes there. On the harder cases, you'll spend at the most five minutes. Um, just trying to more more about playing and seeing how do you make that hip less risky. Um, and it'll be playing with the cut position and it'll be playing with some stem geometries and things. So really not more than five minutes a case, but if you put in that time now, it's going to save you that time in the operating room. Um, when you show up, you immediately know what you're going to do differently um, because you've already made all the maneuvers and then you just do the hip replacement. It makes it a lot simpler on the day of surgery. Perfect. So this case is pretty interesting, actually. You can see that our operative leg here is seven millimeters longer um, than the opposite side, um, which I hate these scenarios kind of the worst. First of all, I hate that she has a valgus neck shaft angle. That's hard. Um, and I hate that the operative leg is longer. So I don't have much room to play with in terms of my lengthening or offset. I hear instead of lengthening, uh, I'm going to go for more offset on her particular case. But if you go into the advanced features here, you can actually know why the operative leg is long. Um, it has to do with their femoral lengths. Right here, you've got the operative leg, 770, and you've got the contralateral leg, 760. But when you break it down, the femur is 395 versus 389. Um, and, and the tibias are actually three millimeters off as well. So hip length is important, but so is the full limb length. Um, I think we're always trying to recreate the full limb length to the right dimension. Um, in this particular case, uh, she may, I don't know if she had some previous hip surgery or something, but something caused that leg to overgrow uh, given her hip dysplasia. So it's nice to have these full leg length measurements here. Um, this is also telling me what my, my neck shaft angle is going to be. Um, Pre-diseased femoral head here at 46 millimeters. So I'm going to go for about a 50 millimeter cup. And here my offsets are about 45 millimeters, and my next shaft angle is 133. So decent information if you want that advanced stuff, or just look at this normal stuff here. Stem version, pretty normal, 6 degrees. Um, with the stem, 8 degrees natively, so we're matching her native anatomy. She's not a dysplastic hip I'm worried about that I need a, an antiversion type of stem on. And my pelvic parameters, also not too exciting. Um, when you look at them just like this, however, if you look back over here in the red box, lumbar flexion is 10 degrees. That's risky, so very stiff spine, and she does have a spine deformity, PILL greater than 20. It's 25 degrees here. Let's have a peek at our spine imaging here. Our pelvis is straight up and down, but so is her back, a very flat back. So she may be a lady. What's her pelvic incidence? Her pelvic incidence is 62, so... Not a little bit on the higher side, but her lumbar lordosis is very, very minimal. So that's, she's got a big spine deformity. And when she leans forward, she actually leans forward quite a bit. Her pelvis goes forward 15 degrees. So she's starting to border having a risky amount of anterior translation. That's the spinal pelvic parameters here in this particular case. Let's run the impingement model as they have it set up here. I'll rotate this to the side so we can see. So. Basically, just about the point where you're going to have impingement there. Uh, if we go to a dual mobility liner, she may actually develop some impingement here, I think, based on the fact that you're going to decrease some offset with that dual mobility liner. You lose one millimeter of offset, now you've got prosthetic impingement. So because of that PILL mismatch, anybody with a PILL greater than 20 
Uh, I'm putting a dual mobility in 100% of those patients because I think that's how risky they are. So with this dual mobility, I'm going to have to tweak my cup position. So we'll tweak this cup position up. Usually the maneuver is an inclination and antiversion. Somewhere in the 45 range of inclination, somewhere in the high 20s, 25, 26, 28-ish. That's pretty good in terms of my prosthetic impingement there. I turn on the bony impingement for those not in the United States. You can see here, um, basically impinging with that one millimeter of offset change and a little bit of shortening. So I'm going to try to make that up when I do my cup and my stem. You can see that it's a little bit different way to think about your hip replacement already. You're thinking about it in a more dynamic way. You're thinking about how each change that you make can actually make a reciprocal change in your impingement and range of motion in order to prevent you from having a dislocation. So this lady is a little bit risky. You know, she doesn't have much arthritis. Her range of motion is probably excessive. She's sort of hip dysplasia, although not too much. And her, her spine is incredibly stiff with a big spine deformity. So she she's starting to add up a bunch of risks. So I like my cup here. Looks pretty reasonable there. Um, my 3D model. Let's see what that looks like. Maybe that's looking a little bit big, maybe on the 3D model. Check my axial views there. You know, maybe I'm taking too much bone. Let's drop that down by a size. I'm going to be more inclined sometimes to go up on the cup in order to get a 28 millimeter inner head on my dual mobility. I think here we're going to stick with that 20 for 52 millimeter cup. We get a 40 millimeter dual mobility head, uh, which is which is better than a 36 millimeter head. So I'm pretty happy with that. Now I've got to make up this femoral shortening, and maybe make up a little bit more offset on my femoral side. So this stem looks undersized again. Wait this to load real quick. So that stem's undersized, so we'll go up a couple sizes on the stem. That's the tad bit in varus, which is not going to help my offset. So we'll fix that. Take it out of varus. Lateralize it a touch. We can go up. Might be able to go up even more. So let's check out our, our heat map here. It's getting pretty thick here in this middle section, so maybe we start going down, you can see we're blowing out the femur on that area. So again, this is another tough case. To be quite honest, you know, I played with these cases a lot of times, and this her femur is actually really difficult to template. Um, this is not going to be the right stem for her either. She may be one you consider cementing. This is a, an elderly female with, with poor bone quality, so this is one I might just go straight to a paper fit. That way I can get a nice next shaft angle recreation. A little bit higher, a little bit too high on the offset there. Come down on our offset. Bring up on the stem. Cement it up there. Take that back, want some offset back. There you go. These August ones are tough. You got it's tough to find a good stem that that matches her anatomy, especially because she's got 45 millimeters of offset with the valgus. And, and there are not many stems that are designed like that. So this is pretty good. I'm lengthening her by three. Um, my offset changed by one. Let's see how that has changed our dynamic mechanics. You can see a little bit how on these complex cases you can get a little bit into the weeds if you wanted to. Um, but there's still no prosthetic impingement. We've got better range of motion there. Bony impingement wise, still not bony impinging. I, I could still even add a little bit more offset if I wanted to. Um, but you can start to see it really teaching me a lot about hip replacements during this templating because I can go to a, maybe I can go to an offset liner. You'll see how that's going to push the, uh, that's going to increase our offset significantly there. It's also going to lengthen, which is nice because I can always sit my stem a little bit more deeper and take care of that. So. Do that real quick. You can see how customizable this is to, to really reproduce that native patient mechanics for what this person needs. 
I think I'm actually pretty happy with this as it is right there. So. That's a nice demonstration, John. Clearly there's uh, implications here for uh, residents and fellows and training to uh, become familiar with the concepts of dynamic planning and total hip replacement. But that, that case is a difficult um, case and, and well explained. Um, question John has come through here. You, you, you mentioned in this scenario your original plan was for a dual mobility. Um, she's got a significant sagittal spinal deformity, as you pointed out. Can you talk a little bit about the, I guess, the criteria for selecting dual mobility and whether these risk factors are, in fact, somewhat additive? So if you've got, maybe you've got a case that doesn't have that PILL mismatch, but they have a degenerative spine with a large standing posterior pelvic tilt, limited lumbar flexion, those types of things, maybe they've got three out of four risk factors. Where, where do you sit on, 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 where do you draw the line, I guess, on, on transitioning your bearing to, uh, to something with more constraint like a dual mobility? So it depends on their impingement profile. If I play around with this system and I can't really figure out a way to make that hip not impinge within reason of my offset and my leg lengths and things, um, that's a hip that's going to get dual mobility. If I see the risk factor of PIO on mismatch greater than 20, that to me is the most important risk factor. So for me, that's an automatic dual mobility. If PIO is okay and there's maybe one or two of the other risk factors, I might be able to get away with just a 36 millimeter head. But as they start adding up in the three and four risk factors, um, you start noticing that there is not a cut position or there is not a leg length offset scenario that eliminates your impingement. The pelvis may be moving so far forward, one direction so far back, there may not actually be a safe zone for that particular patient. Um, so that's when I definitely consider dual mobility as well. But to keep okay. it simple, you know, if you see PILL more than 20, that needs a dual mobility um, because I just think we haven't figured out the mechanics of that kind of situation yet. Yep. Uh, they've got another specific question here, John. Um, Clearly, that femur is flexed and internally rotated there to assess for that impingement yep. scenario. The question is, what is the internal rotation and flexion on that femur? I wonder if you might be able to point that out through the uh, advanced tab there. Yeah, absolutely. So it, you can set it to whatever you want it to be, and, and then they'll run it for you. Um, but it has to be within clinical reason. This particular one is 10 degrees external rotation, 10 degrees of extension, um, which is probably normal. Um, I don't think patients can really extend more than 10 degrees. And in this particular case, there's no impingement posteriorly. I, even if it's you know, turning on the bone, it doesn't, it's not hitting back there. I mean, flexion in this particular case is 80 degrees of flexion, 40 of internal. So this surgeon like, likes to check, and this isn't my case, some generic case, but for me, that would be 90 and 30. So 90 degrees flexion, 30 internal. Um, I, I would want to be completely clear of impingement in that scenario um, for me to feel comfortable. As you get into 90, 45, 90, 60, you feel even more comfortable. I mean, you'll start comparing it to the intraoperative exam. But, but for me, minimum 90 and 30, and then I still like that 10 and 10 number. Very good. Well, we've got probably time for just one more question here, and uh, this is a similar question that came through earlier today as well. But... Uh, John, why not use dual mobility on everyone? So I don't want to really be creating the next problem in orthopedics. Uh, the monoblock dual mobility that they use in Europe are good. They've got some great long-term data, uh, but they're different than the modular dual mobilities we use now. And we do have some confirmed metal reactions, so adverse reactions to metal debris from dual mobility corrosion. And we, in retrievals and pathology analysis at our hospital. So um, it's something to be cognizant of and not something you want to overuse. I would think somewhere between 10 to 15 percent of your practice, based on our incident studies, is probably the sweet spot where you want to end up. I think that's good advice. We've seen those similar numbers um, based on the work that we've done as well. So I think that's probably about right. Uh, well, John, thank you very much. We're approaching, or well, we are actually on the hour mark here, so um, we're going to have to blow the full-time whistle. Um, and thank you very much again, mate, for sharing your insights on the hip spine relationship and the utility of this new particular OPS in, insight platform. Um, as always, John, you've managed to, to really simplify 
um, the explanation here, and thank you so much for that um, very in-depth discussion. And thank you to everyone for making the, the time and effort to dial in this evening in the US and this morning in Australia. Much appreciated. So thanks everyone for your attention. Have a good evening, day, wherever you are.